Before I move on to the next item of business, could I remind guests leaving the gallery that this parliament is still in session and ask that you leave the gallery as quietly as possible, please. Thank you. The next item of business today is the members' business debate on motion number 15486 in the name of Graham Pearson on support for families affected by murder and culpable homicide. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I'd be grateful if members who would like to contribute to the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Graham Pearson to open the debate. Seven minutes or so, Mr Pearson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm grateful to the Parliament for giving me the opportunity to propose a motion uh, in support for families affected by murder and culpable homicide. I start by uh, thanking my colleagues from all parties here in the Parliament who signed in support of the motion. Uh, it gives us the worthwhile opportunity to vent some of the issues which affect a surprising number of people who are affected by homicide across uh, Scotland over the period. Uh, I checked the statistics this morning before coming to the Chamber. In the last 10 years, 887 separate victims were affected by murder and homicide across Scotland from 2005 to the current date. So we have many families in Scotland who unfortunately have to face the trauma and upset of receiving police officers at their homes to tell them that they have lost a family member. Uh, hitherto, uh, many public agencies were involved in supporting those families. Uh, obviously, the police family liaison, Victim Support Scotland, many of the public agencies, social work and local authorities, uh, Victim Information and Advice uh, Centre et al. But a great deal of work has been done on all our behalfs by charity groups, uh, particularly Petal, who have existed based at Hamilton for, for well over two decades now, and more recently, the Moira Fund, who have done a great deal of work uh, recently in supporting those families uh, who face uh, such difficulties. Uh, much has been said over the last years that there are too many agencies who pass clients between them necessarily as the system works currently. So firstly, being involved with the police, then being passed on to the procurator fiscal system, then victim information and advice being involved in it, and victim support Scotland on, on many occasions alongside police family liaison, means that the trauma, the emotional demands, and the demands from officials for necessary uh, responses in terms of um, uh, registering a death, dealing with insurance companies and so forth, are all being met by families who are ill served at that time to deal with such demands. And in England and Wales, a victim support homicide service was created. Uh, I have to admit that even having had more than three decades of experience in, in this kind of, of work, it had passed me by that for some families who are affected by homicide and who are in dire economic circumstances, how do they deal with funeral expenses in, in the heart of the trauma that they face? And the truth is, very often, they deal with it very badly. In some communities, they are lucky enough that communities will we'll gather together funds and pass it on to families in order that they can bury their loved ones with some dignity. Uh, in other circumstances, uh, extended family members collect together and support. But in England and Wales, families who are in dire economic circumstances can approach the Moira Fund and other voluntary agencies who, although they are not uh, in receipt of huge public support in terms of finance from governments, find the means to gather money together to assist families as and when they require it. It dawned on me that it shouldn't be left to charities to try and find the money when uh, members of our communities face such dire uh, circumstances. And it is not beyond the wit of us all to come together to find the means uh, to help 
with arranging funerals, with financing funerals in the short term, uh, covering travel expenses uh, in the short term too, when they are required to attend various necessary outcomes and they have to find the money to get there, uh, and providing the financial support which allows burial to be done with some dignity. In many circumstances, the families may well find that insurance companies come forward in the long term. In some circumstances, after some months, they might even be able to save the money themselves in order to, to pay many of these expenses that we're talking about. But what I offer to Parliament is to consider that when you face the trauma of knowing that you've lost a loved one, worry about the economic impacts should be the furthest from your mind and we should find a way of taking the necessary burden which these families face. I've spoken to those within victim support in the last year over the notion of extending their services to cover. And although by no means do I say it's been appropriately audited, they estimated that in a year, eh, in order to offer the whole range of services that might be required, and in the last year, it would have been 59 families that might have been considered for a uh, support, but many of the families thankfully would be financially secure and not need the support. So we're talking fewer than 59 families to begin with. Uh, the whole range of support would not demand more than a million pounds a year uh, in terms of uh, provision. And that would offer not only the things that I've spoken about, but the counselling that some of these families require uh, during the process and after the court process is, is completed, uh, offering support during appeals processes, because very often the families are overlooked and forgotten. And then in the longer term, when it comes to parole, after many years, families re receive a letter through the post to tell them that people convicted of homicide or murder are going through parole processes. So to cover those whole range of services, victim support had estimated around a million pounds. So I think that it would be right for us as a parliament to seek to provide that support and to invite the minister to consider the implications and look to uh, initiating a broader service. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would also invite the government uh, at this time to think about unifying the victim support services uh, rather than have a separate victim support Scotland and a victim information and advice service that unifying both these services together without any ad additional allocation of budgets would allow a seamless service provision from the point of view of victims and their families. And I again thank the Parliament for giving the opportunity for members to express their view. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please, and I call Christian Allard to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you very much, President Officer. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, the member to bring this to, to the debate. Uh, I, I did read his, his motion. I didn't sign it because it was, uh, uh, if I can, you can say, uh, in his contribution, uh, it only talked about the motion at the end, really, of what he said. So the rest of his contribution, I absolutely agree with him. And he opened uh, our eyes and uh, with all his experience, and, and I, I know he's got vast experience, professional experience on the, on the, on the matter. He opened in our eyes of what families uh, have to uh, endure, and particularly the economical uh, burden. I think it's, it's quite an important one. So uh, I, 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 do, I do very much uh, agree with most of, of what he said. I'm, I'm not so sure about, about about, as I said, the motion. Uh, I thought, uh, as a member of the Justice Committee, uh, we've done a lot over the years. Uh, I think that, for example, in the Victim and Witness Act 2014, and more recently in the Victim Right Regulation 2015, we improved very much the support uh, provided by various organizations uh, with, with, uh, within our justice system. It's true, I, I do agree that for too long, uh, victims have been treated and met feel maybe like bystanders in the, criminal system, in the criminal justice system. But the recent changes, you know, we all voted in, 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 in this parliament. Uh, I've seen more and more consideration given to the rights and the needs 
of victims, and not only victims, of witnesses as well, and it's important uh, to, to, to realize that uh, witnesses needed the support, and I think the new legislation we put forward, this government has put forward, and voted in by this parliament, have really improved the experience uh, of all those people uh, in, 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 into the system. Because at the heart of what we do as a justice committee, of everything that we do, you know, the right of the victims and their families is always there. You know, in every uh, legislation we, we, we debit it, 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 it's always there. Uh, I, well, the minister is here, and I'm sure he will talk about it, but the recent launch of the Victims' Court for Scotland has, has been great news, and, and it's been applauded by the Victim uh, Support Scotland uh, I think it's very uh, a move in the right direction. Uh, I know that uh, Victim Support Support is delighted about the support for services to young uh, victims and witnesses of crimes. Uh, the Victim Court for Scotland set out the right of victim of crimes and who to contact to help and advise. Uh, this right have been put in place, like I said, through the Victim and Witness Act 2014 and the Victims' Right 2015. So you can find a lot of this information uh, uh, on, online, of course, and, and, and we, we can get all this advice there. Uh, Susan Gallagher, who was a victim support Scotland acting chief executive at the time, said as a new code is an important step. And let me quote what we said, presenting of yourself, which said, Victim Support Scotland warmly welcomes the introduction of the Victims Court. Victims and witnesses now have access to information which highlights uh, what the legal rights are in the aftermath of crime. And it's a huge step forward in the journey to ensuring uh, victims have a role in the criminal justice system in Scotland. So we are in a journey, uh, President Officer, and we want to continue on that journey. Uh, there is a, 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 a lot, I agree with Victim Scotland, uh, particularly when we added, and that's an important point, there is still a long way to go before victims are at the heart of the criminal justice system, but the code provides us that step closer. And it's a question of step, I think, in that further step. I could talk as well, President your Officer, about the many family leads officers of, of Police Scotland who are doing a fantastic job today. And now we, we have to, to realize that. We've got multiple roles, and these multiple roles uh, are, 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 really, are really important. They are really, they've got this expertise and these skills uh, to, 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 to manage those roles, and we will have to thank them for, for that as a role. But that is the role, of course, of the third sector organization as well. They provide a, a fantastic support. Uh, uh, we discussed, for example, in the Committee of Justice Bill, that the system is maybe a bit crowded of all this organization, when you're talking about streamlining, what, is, what the member said in his uh, motion, and it's a patchwork of, of organization. Uh, but when, when I hear that, I always respond that this fantastic mosaic of third sector organization is reflecting the diversity of our communities and, uh, you know, we rule our urban communities. And it's in this case that it, it enriches enrich the quality of the support given to families across Scotland. So, as we heard in the Victims and Witness Bill, the coming secretary, at the time, Kenny Kamasko decided not to opt out, for example, for a victim co com commissioner. And, and, and it's what he said, uh, what was said on the matter, is giving the excellent work of, by Victim Support Scotland. It would be an unnecessary, unnecessary extra, extra level of expensive bureaucracy using resources that could be better spent. So I, I'm quite happy the way where we see just now in conclusion, uh, presenting officer. Uh, let me, uh, something a bit, a bit controversial, the lack of apathy, the lack of feeling and emotion and interest is recognized by many as the most common reason for why someone would commit such an act of ending the life of another human being. And it is right, rightly, apathy that makes us uh, stand today to speak up for the people who have experienced the death of a family member through murder and culpable homicide. We do empathize with the victims, with the family members of the victims, because it could happen to us all. My last thought is for the other family, the family that will suffer because one member of this family has committed such a crime. Society, we need to reflect on this. Uh, we don't choose what members of our family will do, and we will are likely to suffer the consequences of whatever happened. President Officer. Thank you. And I call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Annabel Goldie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my thanks to Graham Pearson for securing today's debate on a very difficult but important subject. And I too would praise the work of the Moira Fund and the Petal Fund. The support they give to people affected by murder and culpable homicide is vitally important and should be supported. Today I wanted to highlight just two of the several cases I've been involved in to explain why the support from these two organisations is so important and why in Scotland we need a dedicated victim support homicide service that provides comprehensive support not just in the immediate aftermath of the particular crime but throughout the time 
the victim's family and engage with the justice system. And here is why. In 2008, my constituent Giselle Ross waved goodbye to her two sons, six-year-old Paul and two-year-old Jay, as her former husband Ashok Kal Kalyanji took the boys to visit their grandmother. Ashok later took the boys to the Campsie Fells to a spot he knew their mother loved, and there he put them in his car and stabbed them repeatedly. One of the boys witnessed what happened to his brother before being himself the subject of an attack. Kalyanji then telephoned Giselle and taunted her about the boys before setting fire to his car with himself and the two boys inside. He was found alive by police, but his sons were dead. Now, Kalyanji was examined by three psychiatrists and found to be sane and fit to plead. He eventually pled guilty. In delivering his verdict, Lord Brailsford apologised in court to the Ross family and for the protracted process and the requirement to obtain so many reports before a verdict could be arrived at. It had taken some eight months to get to the point of conviction. But of course, that wasn't the end of the matter, as though there ever could be an, an end for Giselle Ross. But Kalyanji then had his lawyers ask for a review of his conviction upon the grounds of his mental state at the time of the incident. That application was refused in early 2012, but later that, e that year, a further application for review was submitted and this time was granted. After a number of harrowing court hearings, Kalyanji's bid to have his conviction quashed was rejected in May 2014. So this case didn't end with the conviction of Ashok Kalyanji. It continued for another five years while he used the justice system to argue his case, as he was entitled to do. But one could be forgiven for thinking that he simply wanted to continue his vindictive campaign against his former wife, Giselle. But the question which arises is this, what support was available to Giselle during all of that time? The answer is very little and she is not alone. I also want to consider another but very different case where it seems to me that the system could have done more to support a family. My constituent Charles Howe took his wife and young son out for a drive one evening. Out of the blue, another driver swerved across the road and crashed head on into Mr Howe's car. Mr Howe suffered facial injuries and a shattered knee, while his nine-year-old son had a broken arm and facial cuts. Mrs Howe, who was nine months pregnant, died of her injuries, as did her unborn son. The driver of the other vehicle suffered some injuries but ran away from the scene and evaded arrest for some six months. Because of the illness of a witness, Goldie pled, who was the driver of the other car, pled guilty to failing to report an accident, driving without insurance while disqualified, and was admonished on a charge of dangerous driving. I don't intend, presiding officer, to rail against those sentences or those charges here today, although there is much to rail about. But I do want to highlight an aspect of this case that has added to Mr Howe's concerns in the 20 years since the death of his wife and son. And that is this, that his son, who was to be named Dylan, was recorded as having been stillborn, in spite of the fact that he died at nine months gestation, possibly and probably hours away from his natural birth because of the incident his family was involved in. This is something that I think it's fair to say has tortured Mr Howe in the 20 years since, that his son did not have the recognition in law that he feels he should have had, that his birth and most importantly, his death are summed up in the term stillborn. And I wonder if that might be a matter the minister could consider. In conclusion, presiding officer, surely we owe people like Giselle Ross and Charles Howe more support than they currently get. And if there are systems in other places that work better than ours, we should surely be brave enough to acknowledge it and follow their example. Thank you. I now call Annabel Goldie to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too am very pleased to participate in today's members' debate, and I also want to thank Graham. Pearson for securing parliamentary time for such an important and such a very worthwhile topic. Crime affects many thousands of families across Scotland each year, from antisocial behaviour and housebreaking to the unimaginable horrors of child abuse. 
but with the loss of a loved one by another's hand, crime exacts a very tragic toll. And in 2014-15, 59 homicides were recorded, and that means 59 families suffered the trauma of bereavement with the added complexity and emotional difficulty of dealing with the criminal justice system, often for the first time. And the work of organisations such as Victim Support Scotland is both immeasurable and invaluable in this regard. They offer emotional support, impartially helping families to understand and cope with a whole range of emotions at a fraught and particularly overwhelming time. And this is compounded by a common but devastating trend in homicides that most victims are killed by someone they know. The most recent figures show that last year 49% of male victims were killed by an acquaintance, while 43% of female victims were killed by their partner. For bereaved families, such a betrayal is almost impossible to understand, that it is vital that they are supported in their uh, grief. And I think we all agree Patricia Ferguson spoke very, very movingly of a situation where families uh, find themselves in that awful position. And charities such as the Moira Fund and Victim Support are to be commended for the help which they provide. And people experiencing trauma and loss, PETAL, to which Graham Pearson referred, also carry out excellent work, harnessing the services of volunteers, uh, sessional counsellors, holistic therapists and psychotherapeutic therapists to provide free support, advice and counselling to those that need it the most. But without doubt, Families affected by homicide also need practical support, they need guidance, and they need navigation through the system. Because from the moment a, com a homicide has been reported to the point of conviction and beyond, as Patricia Ferguson strikingly illustrated, they will come into contact with any number of official agencies, Police Scotland, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Scottish Courts, uh, Scottish Prison Service, uh, the Parole Board for Scotland, and the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority. They will also have to identify the body of the deceased, liaise with the procurator fiscal about the timing of the funeral arrangements, which may be delayed significantly if a suspect is not arrested expeditiously, and potentially coordinate with police about the victim's personal possessions because they may be used as forensic evidence. Families may also be exposed to the media. The media may follow the circumstances of the death, they may follow any subsequent court case. Media attention can mean intrusive and often unwelcome attention as the bereaved try to go about their day-to-day -day business. And this can be very distressing, especially as family members may not be aware that anything they say could also be prejudicial to any ensuing court case. And all of this, Deputy Presiding Officer, can be intimidating and overwhelming. Now, the Scottish Government has prepared a very helpful document for bereaved families, um, and I, I think that is to be commended. But it is a lengthy document. I think it's quite challenging to digest. So I do agree with Graham Fierce, and there is a distinct risk that families uh, are passed from one organisation to another, leading to gaps and inconsistencies and provision. And I would think there is merit in replicating the Victim Supports Homicide Service already operating in England and Wales. It helps families not just navigate the criminal justice system, but also provides much needed emotional support and practical services. When I looked at their website just a moment ago, they, apart from anything else, have links, if I counted correctly, to 70 other specialist organisations. And so, can I again thank Graham Pearson for bringing the Parliament's attention to this very important issue. And I would urge the Scottish Government to look carefully at that system in England and Wales. I think we should seriously consider if we could adopt that scheme, if it is practicable to do so. Many thanks, and I now call Roger Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would uh, also like to congratulate Graham Pearson on securing this debate and also add my support and praise for the list of organisations that he's referred to, both in his motion and in his introductory remarks. Um, Graham Pearson has referred to 887 separate victims uh, over a period of time. I recognise that culpable homicide and murder are terrible crimes. However, I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government crime and justice figures for 2014-15 show that between 2013-14 and 2014-15 there has been a decrease, albeit only one, down from 60 to the 59 that Annabel Goldie referred to. That 59, however, is the lowest number of recorded homicide cases for a single 12-month period since 1976. 
However, that still means 59 grieving families and loved ones, which is 59 too many. And Patricia Ferguson spoke movingly of the impact on some families. These crimes and the effects they have on victims are so devastating that the provision of services for families affected by these crimes ought to be a high priority. I would like to say that I appreciate fully the point that Graham Pearson has made in his motion with regard to one-to-one -to -one support for families who are coming to terms with a loss of a loved one in tragic circumstances. For anyone who's not suffered such bereavement, the thought of having to go through the process is unimaginable. The services provided by the likes of Petal and the Moira Fund are truly invaluable, and we must not lose sight of the hard work that people in those organisations and in organisations such as Victim Support Scotland carry out every single day. I believe it's fitting that this debate is taking place immediately after Victims Week 2016, at the beginning of which the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, who's sitting in front of me, unveiled the Victims Code for Scotland. When he unveiled the code, he said that, quote, anybody who's been a victim of crime should have confidence that they will receive the right support and advice through the criminal justice process. I sincerely hope that the publication of this code and those words goes some way to ensuring that this is the case. However, I recognise that this code is by no means a silver bullet. It's important that support organisations work together where appropriate to provide the levels of support that victims require and their families. I would certainly hope that this would not result in, as Mr Pearson described it, people being passed around the organisations. I, I recognise that there ought to be a significant amount of work taking place behind the scenes at third sector organisations to provide the support that those families need at that time not least of which, of course, is the support provided by Victim Support Scotland, being the largest organisation providing support and information services to victims and witnesses of crime in Scotland through their community-based victim services and court-based witness services, support effect, uh, uh, supporting around 200,000 people affected by crime every year. However, I recognise their calls for the development of a national support service to provide an enhanced personal response to families and loved ones bereaved by murder and culpable homicide. The effectiveness of the approach down south cannot be ignored, and I share the calls of others for the government to give some consideration to the lessons that can be learned from that approach. Notwithstanding this, however, collaboration, communication and cohesion between existing organisations is vitally important. The Moira Fund, which has been referred to, created after the tragic murder of Moira Jones, is an extremely good example of a charity that produced, provides grants to individuals through, third, through official organisations such as the police. And to those charities which care for families who have lost a loved one through homicide, I pay my homage. The fact that the Moira Fund is backed by patrons such as the Right Honourable Ailish Angelini, who was the then Lord Advocate of Scotland, led the prosecution at the trial of Moira's killer, is an indication of its importance. Presiding Officer, once again, I thank Graham Pearson for bringing this debate, uh, and I uh, hope that the Minister will respond to some of the points that have been made. Many thanks. Before I invite the Minister to respond to the points that have been made in the debate, um, could I advise members that this is actually uh, Graham Pearson, Pearson's last uh, members debate and possibly his last speech in Parliament as he's stepping down? And on that note, can I invite Paul Wheelhouse to respond to the debate, Minister? Sir, and uh, I do th indeed thank Graham Pearson for raising this important issue in the Chamber. And I was indeed going to refer, I would guessed correctly, as it turns out, that this would be Mr Pearson's final speech. And can I say uh, genuinely, uh, with, with sincere sincerity, that uh, I very much enjoy uh, debates in the past with Mr Pearson. I think he's been a very honourable member of this Chamber and indeed has done great credit to his party and, and to uh, the people he served in the south of Scotland in, in, in the passage of time. And indeed, I believe it may well be um, my last opportunity to engage with uh, Ms Goldie as well. So similarly, I think uh, Ms Goldie, whatever our political differences, I, I believe Ms Goldie has been a tremendous asset to the Parliament and is very well respected across the Chamber. So I, I look forward to hearing all sorts of good things about both members of the, as they leave the Chamber. Um, but, presiding officer, uh, we recognise the need for, for victims of crime to have access to the right uh, information and support and the need to improve the experience of those passing through the criminal justice system. I think we've heard very eloquently from members across the Chamber, and most especially, I think, um, Ms Ferguson, very uh, emotional cases that, that she has had to deal with uh, in her constituency. But the, um, the need for, for information support and the need to improve the experience and indeed to have that through care throughout the process of the justice system. It's not just 
at the point of the original prosecution, as I think has been made eloquently by a number of members. As Christian Lard stated, um, we have uh, recently passed legislation, in particular the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 and the recent Victims' Rights Regulations 2015, uh, in our attempt to improve the support provided by the various organisations within our justice system. We do recognise it can be very traumatic for victims to be passed between criminal justice agencies and indeed, of course, their families without receiving any information on how the justice system works. Uh, and this is why we have, have introduced standards of service to ensure victims know what to expect from each agency, and particularly Police Scotland the, the, and the Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal Service, but also the Courts and Tribunal Service. We have encouraged criminal justice agencies to work closely with victim support organisations in the creation of these standards and to establish closer working relationships to ensure that the service we provide is as joined up as possible. I hear very clearly from, from members, uh, Mr Pearson and others, that, that we need to have a joined up uh, system and, and to make sure organisations work together and collaborate. Uh, as Rod Campbell just said. Um, we have introduced new rights to information so that victims can find out exactly what is happening with their case. And these new measures provide additional support for victims, putting their interests at the heart of improvements to our justice system. These legislative changes help us comply with the EU Victims' Rights Directive, uh, which helps ensure victims of crime can have the right kind of help, information and support wherever they are in the EU. And we, however, recognise that victims may not be even aware of their rights or what support is available available to them. And this is why we have launched, as uh, Christian Lard and, and Rod Campbell and other members have referred to, on EU Victims Day, the first Victims Code for Scotland. Um, we appreciate it is the first one. It will evolve over time. We are looking specifically at a version for children uh, to try and make a child-friendly version, because it is obviously, uh, in the way it's worded, mainly aimed at adults. Uh, but we, there is a clear need uh, to work with children first and other organisations to make sure there's a child-friendly version of that document. But in simple, straightforward language, the code provides victims with information about their rights, who can help them, where to go for more information. The code be, can be easily accessed online and is available from criminal justice agencies. And since the 22nd of February, it has been available online in a variety of languages as well, including Polish, Mandarin and Urdu, just to name a few. And I'm also pleased to say that we are currently developing easy read as I say, and child-friendly versions of the code. The code will be made available to victims of crime when they come into contact with the police or other criminal justice agencies and it is intended to help signpost victims to the help and support they may need. We developed the code in discussion uh, with agencies such as the police, courts, the Crown Office and victims groups such as Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland and we will continue to consult with those organisations as the code is made available more widely to ensure that it is providing the information victims require. We recognise uh, the considerable support currently available from the police through family liaison officers. Uh, Graham Pearson referred to them, I think, first, um, and uh, obviously we'll have direct experience of working with family liaison officers uh, from victim information and advice at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and from victim support organisations. I do recognise the point that's been made by Graham Pearson and other members that you know, there appears to be a lot of organisations and there is obviously a risk people being pa piss, uh, passed from uh, pillar to post or feel that way. And that's clearly something we have to, we have to manage carefully. But at present, Police Scotland uh, appoint family liaison officers in cases where a serious crime has been committed and the police determine it would be beneficial to the family. And that's, that's an important point. Uh, FLOs make uh, contact with victims or bereaved relatives during the early stages of the police investigation or very soon after a death. And FLOs are there to provide a link between the family and the senior investigating officer and inquiry team and will identify additional support for the family as well, providing practical assistance, such as managing uh, any media interest in the case, which can sometimes be very intense, as I'm sure members are aware. And they're also uh, responsible for offering guidance on the investigation process to the family, providing advice and guidance to the police investigation. FLOs liaise closely with the Victim Information and, uh, and Advice Service at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service from very early in the investigation before handing the liaison role over to VIA if the investigation moves to prosecution. VIA in turn provide victims of crime with information about the criminal justice system itself. They provide assistance in a case where a victim appears to be vulnerable and help victims to get in touch with organisations that can offer the practical help and support that people were referring to uh, uh, earlier on. And we recognise the importance of supporting victims of crime, which is why the Scottish Government provides funding of just over £4 million per year to victim support organisations. In relation to those bereaved by murder specifically, which is why we're, we're here today, we do agree that providing support is vital. And that is why we provide grant funding to, to PETL, who offer specialist support, counselling services, practical advice relating to the criminal justice system and other matters. The 2014 Act is part of a larger ongoing work to, uh, piece of work to further improve the experience and increase support to victims of crime in the justice system. 
I do encourage individuals and agencies to continually seek new means of supporting victims of crime and continually be aware of identifying areas where improvements can be made to existing provisions. And this is certainly my view, and I will assure you this will continue to be the case beyond implementation of the legislation. Uh, as members have referred to, Victim Support Scotland in their 2015-2019 manifesto have called for the development of a, a national support service uh, to provide an enhanced personal response to families and loved ones bereaved by murder. I certainly hear the sentiment across the chamber that this is something that members, regardless of party, are seeking to, to see happen. I very much welcome uh, Victim Support Scotland's uh, commitment to improving support in this area, but we feel uh, it's vital that we avoid potential duplication of services. Um, and ensure that resources are focused on helping those in need. Uh, PETL, for example, already provides special support for brief families, and more general support is extensively available across Scotland, particularly through Victim Support Scotland and other organisations which should be mentioned this afternoon. And it's for this reason we've encouraged uh, Victim Support Scotland and PETL to consider how, might, how, might, how they might work more closely together to support families in these cases. So I do hear the, the, the very good work that's going on in England uh, and, and, and want to acknowledge that, and it certainly has some attraction to it. But what we need to do is design a system that will work within the landscape we have and, and try and avoid duplication. So not a, necessarily a straight copy across. So we are open to further discussion on this topic and recognise we do need uh, to be fully aware of the needs of those who have suffered bereavement uh, by murder or suicide and support them appropriately. Uh, the concerns raised by Graham Pearson today over potential issues such as the example given of victims feeling they have to explain things again and again as they pass from one justice agency to the next are ones I do recognise. These are ones that point to need uh, to better understand the requirements of victims and we need justice and victim support organisations to work together and to deliver a joined up service. So of course legislation is not the end of the process, um, it's just the beginning. Um, it's obviously a, a constant process of improvement and it's just uh, something that we will need to do in terms of implementation to continue and, and we'll work in collaboration with our partners in the criminal justice system and the third sector to ensure that provisions are implemented effectively. We'll also continue to work to uh, identify improvements that can be made on a non-legislative basis and for too long victims have been treated and made to feel like bystanders in the criminal justice system. Uh, our recent changes will see more consideration given to the rights and needs of victims and witnesses of crime. And it's my hope, and one of, I'm, I'm sure is shared across the Chamber, that the, the recent initiatives will improve the experience of the system, uh, a system which uh, obviously victims turn to in order to see justice served. But I want to again thank uh, Graham Pearson. I uh, mean with all sincerity the points I made earlier on. He has been an excellent member of the Chamber uh, and indeed Annabel Goldie. I wish them great, great success in their future endeavours. Uh, but I hope that Mr Pearson can take some comfort from the fact we are looking at the issues he has raised importantly today and hopefully he will take uh, some satisfaction from any progress that is made hereafter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And can I uh, also add my best wishes to Graham Pearson and Annabel Goldie are standing down from Parliament. And that concludes Graham Pearson's debate support for families affected by murder and culpable homicide. And I suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m.